Watch this. One year ago today, March 22nd, Idaho reported its first death related to the novel coronavirus. Since that day, there have been 1,942 Idahoans who have died from COVID-19 or its complications. That first death reported a little more than a week after the state announced its first confirmed case of COVID-19. During that same time period, from March 13th to the 22nd, we had gone from two confirmed cases to 47. Three days later, Governor Brad Little ordered Idahoans to stay at home to keep the spread of the virus under control. Schools, businesses, government buildings all shut down. Only those with jobs considered necessary to keep people alive or essential services were supposed to go to work. Two weeks into that stay at home order on April 8th, our death toll had risen to 19. We reported that day there was a projection from the University of Washington COVID model that Idaho was in a good position to handle the pandemic. We would have enough hospital beds, ICU beds and ventilators as the pandemic wore on. That same model said at that current projection, we would peak with COVID deaths on April 16th. And it said by August 4th, we would have only seen 57 Idahoans die from COVID and COVID related causes. Of course, the stay at home order was lifted May 1st and Idaho began opening back up in stages so that by August 4th, we had a lot more than 57 COVID deaths in Idaho. We had 214. We were right in the middle of the summer surge then. By the holiday season, though, we kicked it into high gear. 355 deaths for the month of November. Our deadliest month, December, with 472 Idahoans gone. Our pace has slowed since, sure, but here we are today with 1,942 Idahoans gone because of COVID. More than the entire population of Priest River, almost as many as the city of Aberdeen. Deadly airborne viruses aren't new to Idaho. A century ago, there was the Spanish flu pandemic. We have flu seasons every year, but the most flu deaths we have seen in Idaho during the last two decades, according to the Department of Health and Welfare, occurred during the 2017-2018 flu season, where we lost 101 people over that stretch. We've lost nearly 2,000 in 12 months of COVID. Photojournalist Kevin Esslinger collected more than 100 obituaries that mentioned COVID-19 as the cause of death. And that's just 6%. And even at that low of a number, we couldn't tell everyone's story today. But today, one year after we reported our first death, we wanted to look back on a year that has been deadlier than any other in Idaho. To put a name and a face and maybe a short story to at least some of those who should be more than a stat collected by the state, who are remembered as more than a mere number. When we first met Cindy Pollock. Sir, do you want to put some down right here? She and her mother-in-law. The ground's not as frozen right there. Had been putting orange flags in her yard every day. I'm keeping track every day. Since mid-November. Oh, it was November 18 and I had 814. Each one representing an Idahoan who has died from COVID-19 since the middle of March, 2020. Even back then, nine months into the pandemic, she felt we weren't paying enough attention to its toll. I mean, it's for myself to to make myself less numb to all the numbers and to to bring some humanity to it, because really every time you put a flag in there, you're realizing that it's a human life and it's not just an individual person. It's all the people who they love. You know, it's much greater than just this. This 950 planted at the beginning of December wouldn't even be half the flag Cindy would add to her front yard by the middle of March 2021. 1942. Nearly 2,000 individuals taken too soon because of the coronavirus. Like Lloyd David Taylor of Iona, born in Idaho Falls in 1937, he passed away on April 29, 2020 due to complications associated with COVID-19, two weeks after turning 83. In those 83 years, Loy served in the Army, helped raise six kids, and taught in his church. He loved his family, his friends, traveling, and popcorn. On August 9th of last year, Tyler John Harris died at the age of 35 in Boise from complications of COVID-19. A 2003 graduate of Capitol High School, Tyler adored his little brother Tim, 
and they were each other's best friend. His family said he could tell whenever a friend or family member was sad and needed a hug, a gift, or just a laugh. Barbara Warburton passed away on October 27th, 2020, three days after getting a positive COVID test. She was 91, born of Scottish heritage and on the East Coast, where she got her nursing degree from one of the country's top medical schools. Barbara's son said she lived in Greenwich Village during those days, spending time in a little local pub watching Harry Belafonte sing before he got famous. Barbara loved music, her career as a nurse, her family, and a good martini. Oh, uh, you know, she was a very intelligent woman. Um, her and my dad, um, my dad was from England. Uh, they used to go back to England frequently when they retired. Um, just a zest for life, you know. Old school, uh, lived well below their means just because, you know, my mom's from Scottish heritage, my dad grew up poor, so. Denny Arnold of Idaho Falls was diagnosed with COVID-19 on September 26th even though he did all he could to avoid it. His family said it was fitting Denny was born on July 4th, 1945, because he was a firecracker and there was always a reason to celebrate. Denny grew up to be a potato farmer, and like a lot of us, he liked to think himself invincible, having just survived a kidney transplant two years earlier. But it took COVID to take him after 21 days on a ventilator. On November 10th, 95-year-old Kim Kamiko Semba woke to tell her son Randy this would be her last day. They shared a last meal together. Then Kamiko quietly passed away shortly after, succumbing to the residual effects of COVID-19, dying at her son's home in Twin Falls. Unfortunately, COVID wouldn't allow everyone those last special moments at home, even if it wasn't their cause of death. Mildred L. Mumford, 101 years old of CUNA, passed away peacefully on September 5th, 2020, at a Meridian Care facility. Karen Lowry would visit her mother almost every day at that facility. Between my brother and I, we kind of would alternate days, and so he'd go and then I'd go the next day. Then COVID came to Idaho last March. So March 13th, uh, I went to visit her that day and was met uh, with a note on the door saying closed, you know, closed till further notice. It was like our visiting days of touching and seeing and being with her were over. Mildred didn't die from COVID, but Karen believes the isolation likely played a part. And those last months of her mom's life, seeing her through a window, hearing her through a rotary phone, was frustrating and regretful. Regrets that we couldn't hold and touch and feel and regrets that she couldn't understand that. She longed so much. One day I was there and um, we had taken off the screen so that we could sit and see better through the window. Before I left, she reached her hand out through the window and I, I held her hand and I felt so bad. <clears throat> you know, so that guilt of touching your mother um, or not being able to touch and feel, it was tough. COVID forced a lot of us to face situations we couldn't conceive before this past year, like premature death. Roland Herrera was born in San Antonio, Texas, but grew up in Canyon County, spending his teenage years skating at the roller drone. Roland enjoyed fishing, camping, and dancing, usually to Tejano music. His life cut short at the age of 50 due to COVID-19. Peter Gordon Florence and Jr.'s family never would have thought COVID-19 would actually hit them but it did. On November 25th, 47-year-old Pete was diagnosed with the virus. And just three days later, the Boise martial artist who taught women and children self-defense was gone. My father, Noble Dean, was my hero. That same swiftness snuck up and shocked Lisa Dean Erlander. He taught his children and grandchildren how to ski and always reminded us to keep your tips up. COVID claimed her dad back in July at the age of 84 but he only stopped skiing when he was 82. So, and he was still walking five, six miles a day and had just gotten back from a 17 day trip to Vietnam. Noble got the virus during a visit with his grandson at his home in Caldwell. And uh, he got sick a few days later. And then they tested positive a few days after that. And within three weeks, my dad had died. 
Lisa was very close with her dad. Yeah, I can't really get it out of my head. And she plans to keep him close forever, as evidenced by the noble fur she got tattooed on her ankle, a tribute to her father's name and the fact he loved the forest. Yes, ankle tattoos hurt, which is why Lisa got it. I needed something to hurt more than my heart was hurting. And um, so I actually welcomed the pain of the tattoo because it just gave me something else to think about that hurt more than the loss of my dad. It's an enduring notion known by nearly 2,000 other families in Idaho, left with a hole and the hurt of losing a loved one. What isn't known? How many more flags will fill up Cindy Pollock's yard? A small field of honor, a sea of orange that seems to grow in waves every week. That 1,942 total will likely go up today when they tally what was reported over the weekend across the state. Not all of the deaths attributed to COVID had the virus mentioned in their obituary or listed on their death certificate. Suicides have certainly been up this past year, likely due to the fear and anxiety of isolation during the pandemic. We also understand the majority of COVID deaths in Idaho have been white men over the age of 80, a very susceptible age. 990 of them have been 80 plus. 58% are male and nearly 95% are white. But those are just the numbers, which is how we hope these people won't be remembered as just numbers.